This is QRS axis, QRS transition, and R wave progression. In part one of this two part video, I'll break down the concept of the frontal plane QRS axis and I'll help you understand what exactly it means and how it helps you when you're reading your patient's EKG. In part two, I'll spend a little bit more time fleshing out the concepts of the QRS transition and R wave progression, which basically just represent a way to characterize what the QRS complex is doing in the precordial leads. I'll help you understand how we can use the transition in conjunction with the axis to get the best idea of what's going on with your patient's heart. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and start with axis. The QRS axis, which is also known as the mean QRS axis, or sometimes we refer to it as the mean QRS vector, is a depiction of the spatial direction of ventricular activation in the frontal plane. In other words, it tells us the mean direction of ventricular depolarization within the frontal plane. It's a very helpful concept to understand because when you read your patient's EKG, being able to draw the QRS axis can give you a lot of information about your patient's heart. And often we like to think of the axis in conjunction with the QRS transition to get a better idea of what's going on. To better understand this concept, let's take a closer look at what exactly goes on within the ventricular myocardium during the QRS complex. This is a simplified cross-sectional diagram of the heart and the frontal plane. Here you can see the left ventricle, and here you can see the right ventricle. Ventricular activation starts within the intraventricular septum before the impulse rapidly propagates through both ventricles, causing simultaneous depolarization, typically within 100 milliseconds. As you can see here, depolarization of the ventricular myocardium occurs in a coordinated way, starting at the endocardial surface and moving outward at each point you can see on this cross-section. The mean QRS axis is the sum of these individual vectors of depolarization, and it's normally oriented in this direction. Notice that the normal QRS axis is not oriented straight down the middle, but instead it points more towards the left side. This is for a couple of reasons. Number one, because the heart is oriented a little bit more leftward in the chest, and number two, because as you can see here, the forces of left ventricular depolarization are much greater than the forces of right-sided depolarization, simply because the left ventricular mass is so much more. A normal QRS axis is defined as falling somewhere between plus 90 degrees down here next to AVF and negative 30 degrees out here around AVL. When your QRS axis is somewhere between negative 30 degrees and negative 90 degrees out here, we call it left axis deviation. And when your axis is somewhere between plus 90 degrees and 180 degrees out here, we call it right axis deviation. An axis that falls out here in the northwest quadrant, we sometimes refer to as extreme right axis deviation, or a northwest axis, or sometimes we even call it no man's land. Though I'm not sure that's a technical term. Somebody should look that up. Now, determining the QRS axis each time you read an EKG is helpful, because it gives you some important information as to what could be going on with the patient's heart. Let's say I drew a QRS axis that looked like this. Would you call that a normal QRS axis? So yes, it is a normal QRS axis. It falls within the normal range. However, I might use the word horizontal to describe it, just to get a little bit more information from it. Now, while a horizontal QRS axis is in the normal range, it's helpful to think of possible abnormalities that could produce it. You should know, however, that in most patients, a horizontal QRS is a totally normal thing. Can you think of some processes that could be going on with the patient's ventricles that could take a normal QRS axis that's normally directed down here and have it look more horizontal like this one? So left ventricular hypertrophy would produce more forces out in this direction, and so you could see a more horizontal kind of a QRS axis. Note that LVH alone shouldn't cause left axis deviation, but you can at least get a more horizontal kind of an axis. Okay, so you can add forces out here in the vicinity of the left ventricle to produce a more horizontal kind of a QRS axis. Now, where do you think you could take away forces to produce a similar kind of an axis? Well, you could take away forces down here in the vicinity of the inferior leads, such as due to an inferior wall MI. An inferior wall myocardial infarction, that is an MI down here in the vicinity of leads 2, 3, and AVF, can produce a QRS axis that's horizontal or leftward. Now, this diagram is a little bit simplistic in that 
Most inferior MIs involve the inferior wall of the left ventricle. However, right ventricular MIs, which are also classified within the inferior family, can produce similar changes in the QRS axis. We'll talk in more detail about myocardial infarctions later, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of things that can influence your QRS axis. Now, what kind of body habitus do you think is associated with a more horizontal heart? Obesity is associated with a more horizontal kind of a QRS axis, and this likely has something to do with the anatomic positioning of the heart in a patient whose diaphragms sit higher. Similarly, a patient with ascites or a woman who's pregnant might also have a more horizontal kind of a QRS axis. Conduction system abnormalities can also influence the QRS axis in the frontal plane. However, these are a little bit lower yield. Left bundle branch block can produce a QRS axis that's normal, horizontal, or a little bit leftward. Left anterior fascicular block, which represents dysfunction of the left anterior fascicle of the left-sided conduction system, can produce a left axis deviation. However, this finding is a little bit lower yield, and it's a diagnosis of exclusion that can only be made once you've excluded other more important causes of left axis deviation, such as inferior MI. Now, while a left axis deviation is always an abnormal finding, I'll say again that in most patients, having a QRS axis that's horizontal, but not quite leftward, is usually a normal thing. The purpose of this discussion is mostly to get you thinking about how things affect the QRS axis in the frontal plane. And so when you read an EKG and you draw the QRS axis, you should stop and ask yourself, hey, what's the significance of this finding? I'll tell you that when I read an EKG and I draw a QRS axis that's even just horizontal, I start asking myself questions like, hey, could this patient have LVH? Are there signs of inferior MI? So having a good understanding of this concept will help you a lot. Now let's say we drew a QRS axis and instead of it pointing out here, it pointed down here. I would call this a vertical QRS axis. Now, is this in the normal range? Yes. However, it's helpful to think of the kinds of things that can take a QRS axis and make it oriented more in this direction. Now, the kind of things that can produce right axis deviation or a vertical QRS axis are mostly an opposite of the kind of things we talked about that can produce left axis deviation or a horizontal QRS axis. For example, if you increase the forces on the right side, through right ventricular hypertrophy, you can end up with an axis that's more vertical, or it can produce frank right axis deviation. Also, an MI in the vicinity of the lateral leads, leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6, can also cause a vertical QRS axis or right axis deviation. As far as body habitus goes, a patient who's tall and thin, or a patient with emphysema, is more likely to have a more vertical kind of a heart. It's easy to picture this if you compare the chest x-ray of a patient with severe COPD to the chest x-ray of a patient who's obese. You'll notice that the patient who's tall and thin or has severe COPD tends to have diaphragms that sit lower and thus the heart sits more vertically in the chest compared to this patient who's obese whose heart tends to sit more horizontally. I should mention that some patients with severe pulmonary disease can have right axis deviation that has more to do with pulmonary hypertension than it does the anatomic position of the heart in their chest. Now, as far as conduction system abnormalities go, a right bundle branch block is typically associated with a normal QRS axis in the frontal plane. However, a left posterior fascicular block is associated with right axis deviation. Though I should mention again that a left posterior fascicular block is a pretty low yield thing, which is fairly uncommon to see and it's a diagnosis of exclusion after you've excluded other causes of right axis deviation. Now that I've given you a brief overview of the kinds of things that can affect the QRS axis in the frontal plane, let's go ahead and talk about how to determine the axis from looking at the EKG. To understand how we go about figuring out the axis, let's review the concepts of positive, negative, and isoelectric. So remember that when you have depolarization moving in the direction of a lead, you get an electrical deflection that's positive, and when you have depolarization moving away from a lead, you get an electrical deflection that's negative. Now let's say this arrow represents our mean QRS axis. If we looked in lead 1, we would see a QRS complex that's positive because the axis is moving towards lead 1. Now let's say we looked in lead AVL. What do you think it would look like there? Well, because the axis is generally moving towards lead AVL, we would still get a QRS complex that's positive, 
However, it would be a little bit less positive than it is in lead 1, simply because the axis isn't oriented exactly towards lead AVL. And so our QRS complex might look like this, where it's a little bit shorter, or it might look like this, where you have a positive deflection and a negative deflection. However, the negative deflection cancels out some of the positive deflection, such that the net result is a little bit less positive than it is in lead 1. Now, if we had a lead that was directly opposite to lead 1 out here, we would get a QRS complex that would look like a mirror image. It would look very negative. Now, AVR is pretty close to 180, and so let's say it looks pretty similar in AVR, though it would be a little bit less negative. So it might look like this, or it might look like this. And if we had a lead here, it would look positive, but just barely so. And if we had a lead here, it would look negative, but just barely. Thus, you can see we're starting to form two semicircles here, one on the positive side of the axis, in other words, leads where the QRS deflection will look positive, and one on the negative side of the axis, where the leads will show a negative QRS deflection because the axis is generally moving away from them. Now, if you look down here in lead 2, because it's still on the positive side of this semicircle, in other words, because the axis is still generally moving in its direction rather than moving away from it, we would still get a positive deflection, though it would be pretty small. So it might look like this, or it might look like this. And similarly, if we looked in lead 3, it would look pretty similar, but it would be a little bit negative. Now, let's say we looked in lead AVF, which is oriented almost exactly perpendicular to where the axis is pointing. Well, because lead AVF is not really on the positive side or on the negative side, we would get a QRS complex that looks pretty close to net neutral. Okay, and so it might look like this, or it might look like this, where we have a positive and a negative deflection that cancel each other out, such that the net deflection is neutral. And so this is what we would call isoelectric. Every axis has two isoelectric points that are oriented 90 degrees in either direction from it. Now, when you're looking at a patient's limb leads and you're trying to figure out where their axis is pointed, being able to find a lead in which the QRS complex looks isoelectric will help you because it tells you that your axis is pointed exactly 90 degrees away from it. Now, you might point out that lead AVF isn't exactly 90 degrees away from the axis, but it looks like it might be a little bit more, maybe about 95 degrees away. Well, because it's a little bit more than 90 degrees away from the axis, we might draw it like this, where it looks a little bit negative. Now, to give you a sense of what exactly makes a QRS complex positive or negative, let's take a look at this one. Now, I should say that QRS complexes don't normally look like this, but let's say you had this. Would you call this positive, negative, or neutral? Would this be positive? I mean, you can see that the amplitude of the positive deflection is taller. At the same time, you might have observed that that positive deflection has no meat on it. So this is an example of a QRS complex that's negative, simply because the area under the curve of the negative deflection is so much more than the positive deflection. Now, I should say that when we have a QRS complex that's wide, we tend to give a little bit more weight to the initial part of the deflection when trying to determine the axis. However, for the sake of this discussion, let's say that this is not a wide QRS complex. So putting it all together, the easiest way to figure out the axis is to simply go through three steps. And in case you forget the three steps, the only one you really have to remember is step one. Find the isoelectric lead. Keep in mind we determine the QRS axis by looking at the limb leads. Now, the isoelectric lead helps us because it tells us that the axis points 90 degrees away from it. So it can either point 90 degrees in this direction or 90 degrees in this direction. And so for that reason, step two is choose the correct perpendicular. And step three is look back at your isoelectric lead to fine tune it. I'll explain this in a minute. Now, let's try this on a 12 lead. Looking at this EKG, Step one for figuring out the axis is to find the isoelectric lead. So looking here at these six frontal plane leads, which looks most isoelectric to you? So lead one looks slightly positive, while lead AVL looks slightly negative. But looking at the two, I would say AVL is definitely closer to a neutral deflection. So I'm going to pick lead AVL as our isoelectric lead. That said, if you pick lead 1 as your isoelectric lead, you can still figure out the axis if you understand step 3, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, looking at our hexaxial diagram, because lead AVL is over here, that means our axis is going to point either 90 degrees in this direction or 90 degrees in this direction. So all we have to do now is look in one other lead to figure out which direction it goes. 
Now, which of these leads would give us the best idea of whether the axis points in this direction or if it points in this direction? Which lead would help us break the tie? Well, you can see here that lead 2 is directly perpendicular to our isoelectric lead, AVL. That means if our QRS complex looks positive in lead 2, our axis will point toward lead 2, while on the other hand, if our QRS complex looks negative in lead 2, the axis will point exactly opposite to lead 2, near AVR. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at lead 2 to figure out which way our axis goes. So looking at lead 2, our QRS complex is positive. That tells us our axis is moving towards lead 2 rather than away from it. And so if we wanted to, we could even stop right there and draw our axis like this, at about positive 60 degrees. But we're not going to do that, so let's go ahead and look at step 3, which is fine-tune the axis. To fine-tune the axis, we look back at our isoelectric lead and we ask ourselves, is it slightly positive or slightly negative? Now the reason this is helpful is because a lot of the times when we pick an isoelectric lead, it's not actually totally isoelectric, but instead it's a little bit positive or a little bit negative. This step allows us to correct for that. So let's go ahead and try this. We're going to look back at our isoelectric lead, lead AVL, and ask ourselves, is it slightly positive or slightly negative? So looking at lead AVL, we can see our QRS complex is a little bit negative. This tells us that if anything, our axis is oriented slightly away from lead AVL. In other words, instead of our QRS axis pointing exactly 90 degrees away from lead AVL, it's oriented a little bit more than 90 degrees away. And so we can fine tune our QRS axis by drawing it like this, a little bit more than 90 degrees away from lead AVL. Now I'll say that this fine tuning step is often difficult to wrap your head around the first few times you hear about it, and so if you don't get this right now, don't worry about it, it'll come to you eventually. I'll say that for me, being able to fine tune the QRS axis helps me the most with speed, and so instead of sitting around and deliberating about which lead looks most isoelectric, or having to do mental calculations when a QRS complex doesn't look totally neutral, I just don't worry about that stuff. I just go ahead, pick an isoelectric lead, choose the perpendicular, and then come back later to fine tune it.